So here's a question for you. Why doesn't healthcare respond to market forces, or does it? Here to give us insights on these questions is Dr. Mike Chernu, professor of healthcare policy here at Harvard Medical School. His research examines several areas related to controlling health care spending while maintaining or improving quality care. He's one of the nation's experts on these topics and as such serves as the vice chair of the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission and on the Congressional Budget Office's panel of health advisors. Join me in welcoming Mike, who will present, Can Economics Help Us Build a Sustainable Health Care System? I, I am uh, thrilled to be here. Senator Frist's talk at lunch uh, was wonderful, and I'm going to build off of that. I think it's great. I've been listening to some of the uh, talks in the back, and I'm always encouraged by all of the things that can be done. Economics is the dismal science, so you can decide at the end whether the diseases you might get in the future are more dismal than our nation's fiscal future. Um, but that's what I'm going to talk about. So um, let me start where uh, Senator Frist was, and again, I agree. We have a debt problem because of a deficit problem, and that's largely because of a health care spending problem, in particular, Medicare. And the question is, what's the ramification of that? So just to scare you, again, I don't know what's scarier, uh, you know, Alzheimer's or our debt, but uh, if we go on the path that we're on, estimates suggest the tax rates could rise to 70%. That's not up 70%, up to 70%. That's not sustainable. We can't have that system. There's general issues about economic decline. It used to be my life was about healthcare. Now, and I don't mean to sound too self-important, my life's about the future of the country. Because if we can't control spending growth, we have problems well beyond what happens on our healthcare sector. And all the things you've heard, and I haven't heard all of them, and I should say I'm supportive of all of them, we can't get access to all of those technologies unless we can find a way to finance them. And that's a huge challenge. So I'm going to talk about economics and what economics can tell us about fi uh, financing those things. So I know economics is a little boring, and I have no slides, I have no graphs. But um, I will say this. At its core, economics is about the price system. And the price system um, in economics conveys a huge a huge amount of information. It allows producers to convey to consumers how much it costs to produce things. Prices to convey to consumers, you know, what they have to pay, and consumers convey back to producers how much they're willing to pay for different things. So clearly, the price care system's not perfect, but it does a huge amount of stuff without outside intervention, sort of the invisible hand, and that's beautiful. So after college, I went to the Soviet Union. And we were with some people we met there. We were in their apartments. And the glasses were very heavy. Turns out the factory was paid by the pound, actually the kilo. right? They told us that the nails were very flimsy. The nail factory was paid by the nail. If you get the prices wrong, the products that you produce aren't very good. Um, so again, while the price system isn't perfect, it does an amazing job of telling us how many diet snapples to have in a convenience store in Poughkeepsie and how many blue navy socks we need in a Macy's in Atlanta, right? That's the invisible hand. It's beautiful. And if you understand that, you pass Economics 101. We have taken prices out of the healthcare system. We don't have prices. Why? I'm going to give you three reasons. Reason number one is fundamental. We all face the risk of something bad happening to us. I don't know, you don't have to believe me, I think the previous speakers have told you all the bad things that might happen to you. We don't, I don't want to talk about how horrible those things are, and they are horrible. I'm going to talk about just the financial consequences. We don't like those financial consequences. So we end up trying to buy health insurance. In the standard model, you buy health insurance while you're healthy, roughly, and you use it if and when you become ill. By definition, the insurance shields you from the cost of care. That's its purpose. But in doing so, it takes prices out of the system. Second thing is, if you don't have an iPhone, and many of you I'm sure do, or a smartphone in general, I don't really care. I don't know you well enough. I'm sure you're wonderful people. But I don't care if you don't have an iPhone. If you don't purchase health care services, I care about your health. In general, we care about people's health. We're altruistic. So if I charge you money for something, and you decide I don't want to buy that, and you become ill, 
That's a broader social problem than if you decide you don't want an iPhone or a flat screen TV. As a result, the government gets involved in the system, and we finance a lot of things through taxes, and that becomes a serious problem because it's the tax financing component, and the taxes take the price out of the healthcare system. The third reason why we've taken prices out of the healthcare system in, in large part, or at least why they don't work very well, is we're not comfortable with the ability of individuals to search. The way the, price care, the prices work in healthcare is if the price is high, you look for something cheaper. You buy something else. I don't think we're particularly comfortable with the ability of individuals to search. So I'll just my grandmother, she was a wonderful woman. She was bright. She was engaging. But I'm not really comfortable with her shopping for the best cell phone network, let alone the best his, hip surgeon. So I don't want her to face the prices in, in deciding what she's going to do. She simply doesn't have the information. And in healthcare, particularly acute care situations, you know, people don't have the ability, some of whom have cognitive impairments, but even apart from the cognitive impairments, to make the right choices based on price. So we've taken price out of the healthcare system. And the solution is not simply put it back. Because the reasons we took it out of the healthcare system in the first place are valid. We need to have insurance. We are altruistic. We don't believe people can search costlessly amongst different providers. So what are we going to do? What are our options? We, we have to solve this crisis in, in financing independent of anything else we do. What are we going to do? So I don't know if I know the answer to that, you know, but I'm going to tell you something because that's why I'm up here. Um, so the first thing is, we have to pay smarter. Right now, we have a fee-for-service payment system that pays for incredibly small units of care. There's 10 different offices at codes. There's about 50 codes for CT scans. There's you know, thousands of codes. We pay a different amount if you get the same service done in a physician's office versus in a facility. We have debates about incredibly micro-mundane questions about payment. Providers can change the coding. There's all kinds of stuff that we do in this fee-for-service system that encourages increased use, encourages gaming, encourages focusing on gaming the system as opposed to providing a better healthcare system. We need to change the way the fee-for-service system, or the way payment works, away from fee-for-service. And where we're going, in my view, is broadly understood global payment. What I mean by global payment is, instead of paying separately for your surgeon and your anesthesiologist and the hospital bed you were in while the surgeon did the surgery and the assistant surgeon and the post-acute care, and instead of paying for all those little things separately, we would have one fee for caring for a person for an episode or for a period of time. That's the global payment. And in fact, I believe Across the political spectrum, there's agreement on this type of global payment. The Republicans tend to call it premium support, and the idea is we'll give a certain amount of money for you, and you can buy above or below that, sort of premium support, single payment for you. The Democrats, largely speaking, lump this into something that's called accountable care organization model. It's a new model of payment in Medicare, where a global fee is paid to a delivery organization to care for a patient for a year. There's a whole bunch of technical details. I try and tell them to my wife. It bores her to death, so I'm not going to tell you. But there is this basic agreement about putting the system on a budget. So the question is, where's the disagreement? And I think there's two broad areas of disagreement across the political parties that we have to face. The first one is, how do we set the update rates for the global payment over time? Do we have them rise at the rate of GDP? Do we have them increase at the rate of GDP plus 1, GDP plus 2? GDP minus one? How do we set how much this global payment goes up over time? That's not a healthcare question, actually. That's a tax question. And you've heard a lot today about innovations in the healthcare sector. It turns out that the faster you allow these things to rise, the more innovations you're encouraging, because we're going to need money for treatments for Alzheimer's and heart disease. And the, I don't have red and blue cells. I just got some in 2012. But the point remains. Historically, technology tends to increase cost. How quickly we allow uh, cost to rise will matter. The second thing is, do we allow payment above the global payment rate? In economics, if you want more, you can pay to get more. In a premium support model, that's natural. You can choose the health plan that, you know, the premium supports $100. If the plan wants to charge you $120, provide you better access, access to more services, you could pay that. It's not so clear that would work in the um, accountable care organization model, but it might. And we're going to have some debate about the role the prices are going to play. But we can't have that debate assuming markets work perfectly. We have to have that debate recognizing that its markets fail. 
We have to worry about disparities. If we allow organizations to charge above the global payment, that's going to affect poor people differentially than rich people, and we might care about that because we're altruistic. So there's a lot of work to be done in that area. My general view of where folks are in this debate is on the political right. People tend to believe that markets work. In my view, the, the evidence isn't as strong as they would point to. It's actually quite murky. But nevertheless, markets work. The government stinks, which is, has some merit to it. And th they're OK with some income-related disparities. On the political left, the belief tends to be that markets stink. My view is the evidence isn't as strong on that point either. It's actually quite murky about whether markets stink. But anyway, markets stink. The government's good, or at least capable of doing things well. And they want to minimize any type of income-related disparities. Those are fundamental issues of value. And how we play them out will end up being important. But we will move to a new payment system one way or another because we will not be able to sustain the rate of uh, payment growth. So what type of work needs to be done? You know, I don't have labs. and So what type of work needs to be done in order to move us more effectively to a high value, sustainable uh, sort of global payment-based model? I'm going to talk about four things. We need to think about regulation. The regulations are crazy. We have to reorient it away from regulation designed to prevent overuse towards regulation designed to promote quality. And we can get rid of a lot of some of the silly regulations that were put in place to prevent overuse, because if you change the incentives, you don't have to worry about much, as much about overuse. We have to redefine the role of fee-for-service. It won't go away. You need it underneath many of these things. You need it to do things like adjust payments for risk. So we need to think about how we're going to work out risk adjustment, uh, how we're going to work out fee-for-service. Third, we need to think about risk adjustment. In these models, it's complicated. Organizations can make a lot of money if they select healthy people and shun sicker people, because the healthy people will naturally use less care. So there's a process called risk adjustment that tries to pay organizations that treat sicker people a global payment higher than organizations that treat healthier people. But how to do that is problematic. The coding, the data, all that stuff we need is difficult. Developing tools to do that better is really a first order exercise. Um, and the last one uh, I'll call basically antitrust. If we allow markets to work, and we want them to work, as an economist I'm professionally bound to say that, um, we want markets to work. But we have to worry about fundamental problems that arise in economics, like uh, the exercise of market power by organizations that have monopoly power. As organizations combine and get bigger, which is often a good thing for coordination, use of IT, how do we regulate the prices they charge to allow people to face the incentives to get them to do things that reflect the resources that we need for production, but are still uh, not e exploiting cognitive problems or other market power issues. Figuring out how to deal with those issues is, I think, a first order problem. But the alternative, in my view, is an absolute disaster of where we're going. Um, fees getting cut, uh, taxes going up, people not getting access to care. So hopefully, you know, we'll be able to do a better job. And if we come back in the future, if I get to come back in the future, I'll get to tell you about all the successes we've had. So anyway, thank you. You started us with a very provocative question about whether or not um, kind of market effect or economic factors could actually shape shift healthcare or vice versa. What, what, if, um, what would be the major, I guess, recommendations to the system that you would make? Yeah, so the first one, as I alluded to, is we have to move away from a fee-for-service system where we have a payment system that's designed to be provider-centric. We pay the hospitals, we pay the ambulatory surgery centers, we pay the physicians, to a system that is more patient-centered, that tries to think about care holistically and pay for patients and what the patients care about as opposed to providers and how they've organized. So I think that's the, the main mm -hmm. thing. And then we have to come up with a regulatory scheme that's designed to correct market failures but not eliminate the market. So. Thank you. Much appreciated. You've given us much to think about. Thank you. I'll take that one. I'll take that one. OK. Wow. We have had an amazing day. We're not quite done yet. We have an incredible presentation still. And wanted to make a brief announcement. And that is, many of you have to rush out, or you believe you have to rush out to the board meeting, which was scheduled to begin at 4.15. We've moved the start time to 420 to make sure <laughs> that everyone stays on the edge of the